What I want to talk about today is um, a question which is at the heart of the work and research of many people in uh, particle physics um, and astronomy and cosmology, and that is trying to understand the nature of what makes up the universe. So before I get there, let me begin by talking about sort of how to put this into context. Historically, there have been a number of different core ideas that have been important for, for physics, uh, which I would loosely categorize as atomism, the idea that things that we see are made out of fundamentally smaller and simpler things, and something that I would call Copernicanism. Copernicanism, the idea that we are somehow fundamentally not special. And what I'm talking about today is a, a continuation of that Copernican evolution. So if you think about the Copernican evolution, this is where we started. Right? The Earth was the center of the universe, and everything rotated around us. As time went on, we came to understand that we were not the center of the universe, but maybe we were very close to it. It was the sun, and everything went around the sun. After time, we then realized that the sun was just one star out of 100 billion in our galaxy. And as time has gone on, we've come to understand that our galaxy is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies out there in the universe. So we've gone to a point where previously we thought that we were really the core of everything to understanding that actually we are just one tiny point out in a very, very big universe. And the step that we're taking now as a field is transferring that to the next level where it's not just about where we are, but what we are. And that is the discovery and the understanding that the things that make up us, the things that make up everything in this room, protons, neutrons, electrons, atoms, everything we've ever made in the lab is just a tiny fraction of the material and the substance that makes up the universe. So that what we are, this pointer doesn't really point, so I will point with my hand, is just this tiny fraction of 4% of the energy density of the universe, and that most of the energy density of the universe is in some form of what we refer to as dark matter and dark energy. So the problem with this, dark matter and dark energy, is that it is dark. It doesn't interact with light. It is not something we can see. It's not something we can detect. And so we find ourselves somehow in the situation that Dennis finds himself in here, where he says, lots of things are invisible, but we don't know how many because we can't see them. And this is, at the essence, the problem that we have in asking the question of what is dark matter and trying to find it. If we can't see it, how do we discover it? If we don't know what it is, how do we look for it? And that's the topic of my talk. So the questions we have are, what's out there that we can't see? What might it be? And how do we find out? Before I get to the substance of the talk, let me begin by saying that this is a story that has an unknown ending. I do not know what dark matter is. I can't tell you that we will find it tomorrow. I can't tell you we'll find it in 100 years. What I can tell you is that people are working very hard to find it, and we will learn interesting things about it in the next decade. So hopefully I'll be able to convey that. But it's critical that this is the forefront of science. And as the forefront of science, we don't know what's going to happen. So where will we go in this talk? Uh, this is just if, we, if you break apart and you fall asleep or something like that. This is the, the general topics that I'm going to go through. The first are talking about neutrinos and the birth of the dark universe. We often talk about dark matter, but there's actually been a tremendously successful story of dark matter that we've already gone through in the last century. And I want to take you through that, because that gives us a framework for how we might approach search for dark matter in the next century. Then I'll go on to discussing how dark matter is discovered and how we came to believe that it was there. And then I'll go into this question of finding a lamppost. Um, looking for a, types of lampposts, thermal dark matter, and feeling for elephants. I, I, I should have said this before on the, the slide before where I was on, which is that it's a story with an unknown ending, but that if you have to go, the question, the fundamental question in the search for dark matter is, is this going to be a lamppost search, or is this going to be an elephant search? And if you remember nothing else from this talk, that's the one thing you should remember. Lampposts and elephants. OK? Good. So let's begin by talking about how the dark universe was actually first discovered. It was discovered through a very, very simple process, actually. You may know that ordinary matter is made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
But you may not know that a free neutron on its own is actually unstable. It won't last for very long. It will fall apart. It will break apart. And what it will break apart into, experimentally, if you looked at it, is if you just held a neutron for a while and watched it, you would see actually come out, would come out an electron and a proton. And this was observed quite a long time ago. This process is called beta decay. And you can measure the energy of this electron that's coming out. This is a paper from 1935 where they had measured precisely this quantity. And you find that electrons come out with all sorts of different energies. And to you, that might seem perfectly fine, but actually, this was a real crisis for the field when they saw this. Why? Well, it was a crisis because Einstein had already told us before this that E was equal to mc squared. Now, it's much more general than that, but we learned that mass was a form of energy. So if you start with a neutron, that neutron has a certain mass, and thus there's a certain amount of energy that you start with. On this side, the proton has a mass and the electron has a mass, so they have a certain amount of energy. And whatever energy is left over should be transferred to the electron. But the critical point is that the energy of the neutron should be equal to the energy of the proton plus the energy of the electron, its mass plus its motion. But if that were true, then the electron should have a very, very specific energy and not some range of energies. So what they were effectively finding was that this was not holding. The amount of energy that you started with and the amount of energy that you ended up with were actually usually not the same. Usually you started with more energy and some energy was lost. Now, Pauli, in 1930, came up with a solution. And he said, I have done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle which cannot be detected. This is a philosophy that particle physicists have since recovered from. But he said, perhaps what's going on is that there is another particle there that is invisible. And that invisible particle he called the neutrino. And he said, perhaps what's going on is that, yes, you start with the mass of the neutron, and you end up with the proton, the electron, and whatever you're not seeing is just being carried off by this invisible neutrino. And by definition, he said, look, this is an electrically neutral particle. It's, it's invisible. You just can't see it. I'm just going to assert that it's there. And you might think then all hope was lost. But that's not really true. Because you can start with this picture. The picture is that you begin with a neutron, and you end up with an electron and a proton and a neutrino. If this is true, then I should be able to swap the picture around somewhat and start with an electron, a proton, a neutrino, and produce a neutron. So if this direction should happen, then this direction should happen too. Then maybe you can do some sorts of funny manipulations to the picture and say, well, maybe I can take that electron and move it from the front to the back by turning the particle into the antiparticle, turn an electron into its anti-electron particle. And so perhaps this process is something that you can look for. So putting it simply, given that this picture happens of a neutron converting into an electron, a proton, and a neutrino, implies that this picture should happen, that a proton and a neutrino should come together and make a neutron and an antiparticle of an electron. And this is a critical step. I want to just emphasize that this is really a critical step. Because you start off by believing that you've postulated an invisible particle, but the very fact that there's a picture that you can draw of the process means that there are other pictures that you should, can draw that are related to that particle. And namely, that you can have a process by which a neutrino comes in and converts a proton into a neutron. So, Reins and Cohen, in 1953, so 23 years later, actually did this. So put quite simply, they took a nuclear source, like a nuclear reactor, which produces a lot of neutrinos. Then they took a water tank, which has a lot of protons, and they put some detectors. Then they put a shield to block all other sorts of radiation from coming from a nuclear reactor. So don't try this at home. And then they watched to see what would happen. If this hypothesis was correct, there should have been a beam of neutrinos coming from the nuclear source into the water tank. Those protons in the water tank should then convert into neutrons and anti-electrons, which you could then observe. And indeed, that is what they observed. And for this, they got the Nobel Prize. And I want to just 
emphasize that this was a long process, but it was a methodical process where the theorist came, suggested the explanation of what was going on, drew the picture, the experimentalist then took that picture and then converted it into something that was detectable. At this point, we're well past just discovering neutrinos. We can actually look for them in all sorts of places. So nuclear reactors produce neutrinos, but actually neutrinos are being produced all over the place. They're produced in particular from cosmic rays. So our atmosphere is constantly being bombarded by high energy particles, and those high energy particles produce neutrinos. And also the sun. The sun is powered by nuclear reactions in its core, and those nuclear reactions has a, a, have a, as a byproduct the production of neutrinos. A long time ago, John Bacall calculated in his standard solar model how many neutrinos there should be produced from the sun. And I think this is a really lovely, amazing number because it gives you a sense of how rich the dark universe is, is that if you hold up your pinky fingernail and you just look at it, right now, at this second, every second, 100 billion neutrinos pass through your pinky fingernail. So 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion, 400 billion, through there. Through your body, we're talking about trillions and trillions. And in this room, millions of trillions of neutrinos are flooding through this room every second. And yet we are completely unaware of them because they are so weakly interacting. So this is the first indication that really the dark universe isn't just the possibility of particles, but that actually these dark particles are all around us and like the force, moving through us, binding the universe and the galaxy together. So John Bacall predicted the number of neutrinos that you should see on Earth. Ray Davis then went and built a detector whereby individual chlorine atoms basically would be converted into individual argon atoms, and then he counted the individual argon atoms and found that very close to John Bacall's calculation, uh, the number was right. He actually measured a quarter of them, which we've subsequently come to understand the difference between these numbers. But the important thing was that there was a prediction by Bacall and an observation of neutrinos. And now, we don't just try to find neutrinos from the sun, we study them continuously. This is a picture of the Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. If you look at this picture here, in the back, that's actually a boat that's an inflatable raft with two scientists in it. They're installing photo detectors inside of this. So each one of these circles is a photo detector detecting light, very, very sensitive light detector. And what happens in that detector is that neutrinos from the sun or other sources come into that tank of water, scatter off the, the water, produce a signal of light, and then that light is detected by these photo detectors. And at this point, this is a, just a miraculous image because this is an image of the sun at night taken by the Super Kamiokande detector. So they can actually image the sun through its neutrinos that have passed all the way through the Earth. So you think at night that you can't see the sun, but at Super Kamiokande, they can still see it. And this is what it looks like. I take you through this because I really want to emphasize that this is how we want to look for the dark universe. Okay? You start with a hypothesis. In Pauli's case, it's that there was an invisible particle participating in beta decay. Then what you do is you take that and you try to build a lamppost. The idea of lampposts is that you try to get some light somewhere where you can look. Right? There's the old story of the drunk looking for their keys and they can't find them and they're looking under the lamppost and you say, well, are you sure this is where you lost them? And the drunk says, no, I left them over there. And you say, well, why are you looking here? You say, well, this is where the light is. And that's to some extent where we find ourselves in dark matter because we can't look everywhere. We can't find every type of dark particle. But by taking different hypotheses of what dark matter might be, you can build lampposts for yourself and look for dark matter. If you build the best one or a good one, you'll discover it. And if you come to understand it, then someday you hope to do astronomy or something else, to change these particles from something that you're hoping to discover to tools that allow you to know about the universe. So a critical thing, then, you should take home is that the dark universe exists. 
There is a component of the universe out there that you cannot see that is in this room and that is very important for the dynamics and the processes going on in the universe. So just because we can't see something doesn't mean that it's not very, very important. But that's not the end of the story. Otherwise, I would be a very short talk. What we then found was that actually this was just the tip of the iceberg, that there's actually a tremendous amount of stuff out there in the dark universe. So how do you see in the dark? The way you see in the dark, if you can't see things with light, you can feel things with their gravity. That's the core that allows us to talk about dark matter. So what is this? In the center of the Milky Way, you can look at the stars and their motions in the very, very, very center of the Milky Way. And that's what these are. These are all individual stars right around the center of the Milky Way. There's nothing where this big star is, but if you look at the motions of these stars, whoops, if you look at the motions of these stars, you'll see, for instance, this one here comes right past it and slingshots around, right? Just looking at the orbits of these stars in the center of the Milky Way tells you very, very clearly, even though there's nothing visible where this star is, there must be some very, very strong gravitating mass that's pulling these objects in their motions, that's pulling them in these orbits. And now we understand what that is. We believe that's a supermassive black hole, a black hole that has a mass about a million times greater than that of our sun, that's more or less not luminous, but has incredibly strong gravitational pull that's influencing the motions of things around it. But this is a lesson, and the lesson is, is that even if you can't see things, if there's enough mass there, it should gravitationally influence the things around it. So this is Fritz Wicke. I didn't know Fritz Wicke. Uh, he was before my time. Uh, but he was a brilliant scientist, but by most measures was somewhat cantankerous. Um, and, but one thing that he did was to look at the coma cluster. So the coma cluster is a group of galaxies. So our Milky Way is in a group of galaxies. The coma cluster is another group of galaxies. So you have a variety of galaxies that are all pulling on each other and orbiting around each other. And what he did was he made a very, very simple observation. If here are a bunch of galaxies that are all kind of pulling on each other, and you measure how fast all these galaxies are moving, that gives you a sense of how much mass there should be there. So if these things, all these galaxies are moving very slowly, then there's not a lot of mass pulling on them. If, in contrast, they're moving very quickly, then that means there must be a lot of mass there that's pulling on them. So he went and he observed the galaxies in the coma cluster, and the conclusion was that only 1% of the mass in the coma cluster was visible. Now, that's not yet evidence for dark matter, because maybe it's just that only some of the stuff turns into stars, which is true, or something else. So, but, but, but regardless, the first point in the history of the dark universe is this observation that most of the mass out there is not something you can see. Most of the mass that's there is in some form that's invisible. So let's jump forward to 1970. This is Vera Rubin. What she did was she looked at the rotation of spiral galaxies. So galaxies like the Milky Way spin in a circle, and what's pulling us in that circle is the gravity of the Milky Way itself, or a galaxy is being pulled by the mass that's inside of it. So what she said was that since most of the mass that you observe is in the center, there should be a very strong gravitational pull near the center. And out here, where you're far away from all that mass, the gravitational pull is weaker. Thus, you would naturally expect that where things are being pulled harder, they will move fast. And where things are being pulled much more weakly, they will move more slowly. So she did an observation, and this is one of them. So she went from the center of the galaxy out, and what she expected was, as I said, that the velocity, which is this line that she expected, should rise where there's a lot of stuff, and then should begin to fall off. As you move farther and farther away from the center, the gravity should get weaker, and so that pull, as it gets weaker, should mean things move more slowly. But what she actually found 
was that velocities actually rose and then just continued to stay flat. Quite different from what she expected. So the conclusion was that there must actually be a tremendous amount of mass out here that's pulling on these objects, keeping them in motion. Mass that you can't see. And now things are starting to get more interesting. Because all Swicky told us was that there's a lot of mass that you can't see. Rubin tells us that not only can you not see that mass, but that mass has a different distribution than ordinary mass. Ordinary mass has cooled down and settled into the center of the galaxy, and this mysterious dark matter seems to have stayed very poofy and continues to surround the galaxy in a halo. By now, we have sources of evidence for the existence of dark matter from many, many, many different places. This is a, uh, a quintessential example called the bullet cluster. The bullet cluster is actually two galaxy clusters that collided together. What we can do is we know that gravity bends light, and so you can look where light is being bent the most, and that tells you where there's a lot of mass. So this blue here is where light is being bent, so there's a lot of mass here. But you can also ask where x-rays are coming from, and x-rays are coming from where it's pink. And we believe that the x-rays trace ordinary atomic matter. So what it looks like happened here was you had two galaxy clusters that came together, collided. The ordinary matter ran into itself and slowed down. The dark matter didn't touch anything and continued to move on. And so you've separated out the dark matter from the ordinary matter. And this is one of a few examples that we have of this, where we have a system where we see dark matter there and ordinary matter there actually separated from each other. But we can also do other things. This is an image of light left over from the Big Bang. It's called the cosmic microwave background. It's coming from every single direction, and it has these tiny, tiny, tiny fluctuations in them. It's a technically different, difficult, but conceptually simple calculation to understand what those fluctuations should look like if there is dark matter or not dark matter in the same sense that water sloshes around differently if it's very, very viscous and muddy, or if it's not. So we can calculate that difference. And when you look at that light from the Big Bang, we see that there is evidence for dark matter in it. We can go out and measure the amount of light elements in the universe, so lithium, helium, deuterium, and find out how much there is and use that to figure out how much stuff there should be in the universe. And we can look at all the galaxies in the universe and find how they're distributed. Are they distributed very much together? Or are they very far apart? These things then also tell us about whether there's dark matter in the universe. Each one of these images, which I am glancing through in a total of two minutes, would be an entire talk on their own. So I'm not going to go into them, except to say that when we look at how much light elements there are, lithium, helium, deuterium, when we look at clusters like the bullet cluster, where we can measure the mass through the gravity, when we look at the light from the Big Bang, when we look at the distribution of galaxies, each one of these things points back to this idea that there must be a sizable fraction of the universe in the form of dark matter. Again and again, we see the same thing, that there must be dark matter in the universe. And these tests are coming from very different scales at very different eras of the universe. This is coming from the first few minutes of the universe. This is coming after a few hundred thousand years in the life of the universe. This is coming after billions of years in the life of the universe. So these are different tests at different scales and at different times, but they all point to the same idea, which is that there is a lot of dark matter out there, and we don't know what it is. So if we accept that there is dark matter, the question you want to ask is, how do you find it? And I don't know about you, but whenever I want to understand something, the first thing I do is Google it. So I did that. How do you find dark matter? Where is it? This is what I found. I found an article from the Kennedy School of Government by these people who said that uh, there are sizable exports of dark matter from the United States, and they appear to be fairly steady. So I don't know. But then they said it doesn't look like there's a major need for rebalancing of the global economy. And this was in 2006. So maybe this is not the most reputable source. So, Maybe that's not it. So how do you find dark matter if Google doesn't serve you? And the answer is, and I mean this in, in all humility, humility, is that you guess, hopefully intelligently. 
I don't want to make you that sound like a scary thing, but this is really at the essence what it is. You, if, if you don't know what dark matter is, you don't know how to look for it. If you don't have an idea of what dark matter could be, you don't know what its signal would be in an underground detector or in space or in anywhere you look. So you have to come up with an idea. Now, that idea, you would like to be broad enough that hopefully it's not capturing only a single idea, but not so broad that it doesn't give you any experimental consequences. So one idea that physicists have held on to and have used is to begin with a picture. So the idea of the picture is that perhaps there is a process by which dark matter can come together, collide, and then produce ordinary matter. I'm not going to specify at the moment what that process is, just that there is some process like this that can occur. So dark matter could convert into ordinary matter, ordinary matter can convert into dark matter, and so on. If this is true, you can draw this picture. Dark matter coming in, ordinary matter coming out. If that's true, then you should also be able to draw a picture where ordinary matter comes in and dark matter comes out. And so basically, in the early universe, what we expect should be going on is that when the universe is much, much smaller than it currently is, when things are much, much denser than they are today and things are much, much hotter, there should be a process by which ordinary matter and dark matter are converting back and forth. And in that era, there should be roughly the same amount of dark matter as ordinary matter. That's what we believe. Now, this process is happening very, very efficiently, dark matter and ordinary matter interconverting. But as time goes on, the universe expands. The system cools down. And eventually, this process stops being very efficient. So if dark matter is, say, heavier than protons, eventually, dark matter cools down enough that dark matter can turn into protons because the energy in the dark matter is greater than the energy in the protons. But if the protons are very, very cool, the energy in the protons is not enough to produce the dark matter. And if you reach this point, then gradually the universe begins favoring, disfavoring dark matter and favoring ordinary matter. Those protons and antiprotons then ultimately turn into photons. But this process then allows dark matter to deplete itself. So there's less and less and less and less dark matter gradually as the universe is cooling down until things move so far apart that dark matter stops running into itself. So to summarize, dark matter is converting into ordinary matter and ordinary matter back into dark matter. But eventually, the universe is sufficiently cool that protons and ordinary matter no longer produce dark matter, only the other way. And so dark matter is depleting itself until the universe is so dilute that this process stops. So that's, in this picture, where all the dark matter comes from. It comes from this thermal equilibrium process in the early universe. And so measuring, when you go out and you measure how much dark matter there is today, that tells you something about this process. That tells you something about how efficiently this process is occurring. OK, how does that help us find it? Well. Just as with Polly, you have a picture. You can ask what you can do with it. One of the things you can do with this is to rotate it. If there is a diagram, if there is a picture by which dark matter comes in and turns into ordinary matter, then I should be able to turn that picture on its side. And now what this looks like is a picture where dark matter and ordinary matter come in together, and they run into each other. So I should have a picture where dark matter could come into this room, find an atom, smack it, and deposit some energy. This is your lamppost. This is how you might look for it. That if dark matter can be converted into ordinary matter, dark matter should interact with ordinary matter, and thus dark matter should be able to transfer energy to ordinary matter. So how do you do this? The first thing you need to do is to build a big detector. You're going to build an enormous volume of something, and that something is going to sit there, and you're going to watch it. Just like with Super Kamiokande, where there was this enormous volume of water to look for neutrinos, here you need an enormous volume of something, and you're going to watch it and wait for dark matter to come in and hit something. Typically, the size of something you need can vary from, in some cases, a few hundred grams, so pretty small, to several tons, which are the bigger experiments going on today. 
Then you typically have to go deep underground to shield from cosmic rays and get rid of all of your other background. This last step is, of course, the hardest one, uh, and I won't be taking you through it, uh, but it is the essence of how you do these searches. Currently, there are a few really cutting edge searches that are out there. I'm not going to highlight all of them, I just want to take you through some of them. Probably the most profound ones, the ones that are pushing most forward, are Xenon 1 ton, which will be upgraded into Xenon n ton, LZ, the Lux Zeppelin collaboration, and Sensei, this is Reuven Essig, who is somewhere uh, from Stony Brook. Um, these two experiments are enormous vats of liquid xenon that they bury deep underground, and they wait for dark matter to come in, smack into a xenon atom, and produce some light. Sensei is a much newer experiment that looks at different types of dark matter, where they're actually using semiconductors to look for dark matter to come into the semiconductor and deposit energy. So how do we think about these searches? Well, if you go to a particle physics conference, you'll see a plot like this. And it's a very busy plot, so don't worry about it. I'm not expecting you to take in this information right here. But let me just tell you what people are trying to talk about. On the x-axis here, you have the mass of the dark matter. Okay? So the dark matter, we don't know what, even what its mass is. Its mass could be very small. Its mass could be very large. Here is roughly the mass of the proton. Okay? So these are very, very heavy dark matter particles, heavier than the proton, heavy like as much as, as ordinary nuclei. And then down here are lighter dark matter particles. This region here, oh, I should have said, this y-axis here is a measure of how strongly the dark matter talks to us. We call it the cross-section, but it's effectively just a measure of if dark matter comes into your detector, how likely is it to interact with something? Up here, the interaction is much more likely, and as you go down, the interaction is less and less likely. This white region here is the region which has been so far probed by experiments. This gray region is the region which has so far not been probed by experiments, and actually all this has not been probed by experiments. And this yellow region is actually the region where the neutrinos from the sun and other sources start becoming a problem for these experiments. So where you can no longer have zero background. But you look at this plot and you say, OK, there's a plot. There's some region that's allowed. There's some region that's, that's ruled out. But who cares, right? Does this mean anything? And I would like to tell you, yes. So when we do quantum field theory, we understand forces via particles. So electromagnetic forces are mediated by the photon. Strong forces are mediated by gluons. The analogy I like to use is the basketball analogy. So you can imagine two players, one with a basketball, and you throw the basketball out, you fly backwards. The other person catches the basketball, and they fly backwards. You have interacted, and there was a mediator that mediated that interaction. There was something that allowed you to communicate. In this case, it was the basketball. So you can ask a question, what is allowing the dark matter to talk to us? It's not the photon, because dark matter doesn't interact electromagnetically. Now, the best candidates at the moment are the Higgs boson and something new. Now, the Higgs boson, you have probably heard a lot about. It's been in a lot of the news. But in case you haven't, the Higgs boson, we now understand to be the particle that gives mass to all of the fundamental particles of the standard model. Quarks get their mass from the Higgs boson. Electrons, muons, taus get their mass from the Higgs boson. Gauge bosons, the massive particles of the standard model, all of them get their masses from the Higgs boson. So you might think maybe dark matter also gets its mass from the Higgs boson. That would be a reasonable thing to ask. But it doesn't have to be the Higgs boson. It might be something new, something that we haven't detected yet, some new particle. So let's consider the first case. It's a very reasonable thing. All the particles we know about in the standard model get their mass from the Higgs boson. Perhaps the dark matter gets its mass or some fraction of its mass from the Higgs boson as well. It turns out that if you make that simple assumption, then that picks out a very special place on this plot. It picks out this region down here, which is already partially excluded. And the upcoming experiments will go through this and answer this question. So I want to point this out, because this is not just a question of you know, limit curves that are marching down 
indefinitely, and people just looking for stuff and finding nothing. This is answering a qualitative question. The question that people are answering right now with these experiments is, does dark matter talk to the Higgs boson like we talk to the Higgs boson? If we don't see anything here, if they do this experiment and they don't discover anything at Xenon and Lux, they will answer that question. Well, OK, maybe it's not the Higgs boson. Maybe that's not what's going on. Maybe the alternative could be that everything we know in the standard model is very complicated. Right? We've got many different, if you look at the periodic table, you've got more than 100 different elements there. You've got protons and neutrons. You've got electrons, variety of orbitals, photons, exotic particles that you maybe have never heard of. There is a tremendously rich structure there. So it could be that the dark sector isn't just one particle. Maybe it's not just dark matter. Maybe it's a whole dark sector. Maybe dark matter has its own forces, its own atoms, its own properties. Now, there are constraints on that, but it's quite possible that the dark sector isn't a single particle, but a particle with its own interactions and richness that's waiting to be discovered. And that dark sector, just like we have a photon, that dark sector might also have its own photon, a dark photon. Maybe not the cleverest name, but the one we use. And perhaps that dark photon, although we are not very charged under it, perhaps we have a very, very, very small interaction with that dark photon. So you can ask, maybe this process is mediated not by a photon, but by a dark photon. And then it turns out that actually this is very predictive. You might think that you could throw up your hands and do anything you want, but it turns out that's not the case. And that the experiment sensei, and ones like it, then tell you that you should lie in this region, a region that will also be probed by upcoming experiments in the near future. As a side comment, if you have this dark sector, then you don't just have to look for dark matter coming into your experiment and smacking into stuff. You can look for those other particles as well. There are experiments underway and experiments that uh, are still in the design concept where we might hope to actually make dark photons here in the United States, in Europe. So this is an exciting era because we're not just looking for dark matter, but we have the possibility of starting to produce these dark sector particles as well, if they're there. And I want to emphasize that it's not, while of course we would love to discover dark matter this way, and we would love to discover dark particles this way, these experiments are answering important qualitative questions. The questions that they are answering are first, does dark matter get any of its mass from the Higgs boson? We do, does it? We will know the answer to that question very soon. We'll also answer the question, if it's not the Higgs boson, could dark matter have been in thermal contact with us, exchanging its energy back and forth in other ways? That is also a question we will answer largely soon. So we're not just answering, oh, we're looking for something and we're finding it or not. We are answering questions about the nature of dark matter and the history of the universe. And we'll know these answers in the next decade. But this is all under the assumption, finding it is all under the assumption that it lies under one of these lampposts. The idea, which is a general idea and is a good idea, is that maybe dark matter and ordinary matter can interconvert. And if they do, there are opportunities to look for it. But we must confront the question and the possibility that it is not under that lamppost, and it's not under any other lamppost that we've thought of, and perhaps it is not under any lamppost that we will find in the next 100 years. What do you do then? Well, we are aided by the fact that even if we can't directly test or make the dark matter in a terrestrial experiment, there is dark matter out there. This is an image of the Milky Way. So what you do is you take the entire sky, you take an entire image of the sky, you cut it down the middle, and then you unfold it. And then you project it onto the screen. This is the center of the Milky Way. Out here, you see the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. These are small galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way. But what you can't see is that we actually believe that this galaxy is full of dark objects. So we believe that our galaxy is embedded in a large halo of dark matter, and we believe that our, dark, our galaxy should be full of small halos of dark matter that are drifting among, inside of it. We also expect that inside of our galaxy there could be black holes, which would be part of this dark matter. 
And so there's the possibility that even if you can't produce this stuff terrestrially, and even if you can't really understand the detailed nature of dark matter, you may be able to go out and look for it by looking at these dark objects that are floating through the Milky Way. Well, how will you see them? Right? I've already said that you can't see them, so how will you look for these? And the answer is gravity. Just like the way that we saw the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, we can look for these dark objects floating through the Milky Way. But it's a little different. Einstein taught us that everything is affected by gravity, not just matter. If you throw a rock up in the air, it comes back down. But it turns out that if you send a light signal past a planet, the gravity will deflect that light as well. This is one of the first quantitative predictions of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And so if you have a luminous source, a star, a galaxy, or something that's very, very distant, and between you and it, there is something else, a black hole or a dark clump or something like this, then the light that is coming from here will be deflected and will come at you from another angle. So this is uh, a movie of what would happen if you're looking at a background field of galaxies and a dark object, like a black hole, were to come through it. This is what you'd see. The motions that you're seeing here are actually what would happen. As this black hole is coming from the side, these things would start to move away and move up and around, and you would see this object coming through here. And in the middle, you see these very, very dramatic, what are called strong lensing events, where you dramatically distort the objects you look at. But let's back it up a little bit. You can also black out, block out the middle part where the strong lensing is occurring and just look at these distant galaxies. As this black hole, or whatever dark object it is, comes through here, you would see these background objects move. So as this black hole or dark halo comes across your field of view, the things behind it will look like they're moving around. And it turns out that we are in an incredibly interesting era for this because of an experiment that is underway currently called Gaia. Oh, don't see talk by Losanti. That's Gaia is a satellite that measures extremely precisely the locations of one billion stars in the Milky Way. Here is the Milky Way that you saw before. Here is the Large Magellanic Cloud, and here is the Small Magellanic Cloud. You can zoom in on this Large Magellanic Cloud, and you can start seeing its spiral properties. You can then pick a spot here and zoom in there and see this. Each one of these dots is a star. Okay. And the accuracy that Gaia has is one one hundred thousandth more accurate than this region here. So this is an incredibly precise object, or incredibly precise satellite, that allows us to measure the motions, the positions of all of these stars very, very accurately in the Milky Way. And in fact, it measures them so accurately that these stars that you look up and you think of as stationary in the sky, we can watch as they drift one one hundred thousandth of a degree, actually less than that, across the sky, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of, uh, of a degree across the sky. We watch that motion with the Gaia satellite. So what that means is that you can now look for these lenses in this indirect way. And this is an exciting opportunity, which is one of these lensing possibilities that exist now. So you can go out and imagine that there was some dark object that's moving in front of you, it would induce motions of the background stars, and you can look for those induced motions. This is an ongoing project. The first Gaia data release was just in April. But this is the kind of thing that we are now capable of doing because we're entering into this era where our understanding of where things are is accurate enough that we can actually look at how dark objects would distort them, which makes this an incredibly exciting time. So I said that the end of the day, this talk was a fundamental question of, are we talking about lampposts or are we talking about elephants? The reason why I picked those is because the idea of lamppost is that you actually find something that helps you look exactly where dark matter is. If you find the right lamppost, if you come up with the right idea, then it will shine down on it and you will be able to discover dark matter and you will be able to make it, study it, touch it in some way. 
But that's not necessarily the future that's going to be out there for us. The other possibility is the story of the blind man and the elephant, right? Where one reaches out and feels one part of it, and another reaches out and feels another part of it, and another reaches out and feels another part of it. And you never quite get to see what's there. So if the lamppost story is true, perhaps Sensei comes and illuminates part of dark matter by detecting it as it flies through there. And these other experiments come and start showing us it's being produced in the dark forces. And we come to a complete picture of what dark matter is. But that may not be the future we have. The future we may have is that possibly we'll have an experiment that comes and reveals to us a tiny corner of what dark matter is, maybe as these dark objects drift across us. Maybe we will see some indirect parts of how dark matter acts by studying how the universe expands. And maybe another tiny corner we will understand by looking at how galaxies evolve and change. But the rest of it will be things that we have to fill in with our imagination. It may be that we never have a complete picture. But regardless, I want to emphasize, whether we end up with the lamppost or whether we end up with the elephant, this is an exciting time for dark matter researchers. We are asking qualitatively interesting questions. This is not just an era where we're pushing forward decade by decade, improving our limits, even if we find nothing. We are answering questions. We're going to answer the question, if dark matter talks to the Higgs boson. That's a fundamental question. Ever since the Higgs boson was discovered, we wanted to know the answer to this question. Does it talk to other things or just us? In this era, we will also find out, very possibly, if dark matter has its own dark force that also talks to us just a little bit. If it does, then we should be able to see this dark matter interact in an experiment like Sensei, or we should be able to make these dark photons at these other experiments. And lastly, in this era, we are going to learn whether or not there are dense black holes or clumps of dark matter that are drifting through the Milky Way and distort the images that we see behind them. But I would caution everybody in this room to be patient. The neutrino took 20 years from its hypothesis to its discovery. The Higgs boson took 50 years from its hypothesis to discovery. And this is a situation where, in both of those cases, you really knew what you were talking about. You actually had some theoretical hold to know what you were looking for. Dark matter is not like that. Dark matter is much harder. So I don't know if we'll find it in the next 10 years. I'll not know if we'll find it in the next 100 years. But I think that we're going to be answering important questions in this next era. And so from my perspective, uh, there's a tremendously bright future in the search for dark matter and will be for some time. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes? No. OK. One minute. In the, the elephant picture, well, in the picture where we're actually not going, where we're going to find dark matter as it moves across the sky and displaces things, these objects are moving by of order 100 micro arc seconds. So for those of you who don't do angles, uh, very, very precise angles all the time, we, you're probably familiar that there's 360 degrees in a circle. You can then divide up one degree into 60 minutes, arc minutes, and then, so then you can divide up that arc minute into 60 arc seconds. So an arc second is 1 3,600th of a degree. And now we're talking about a milli arc second. So we're talking about 1 3 millionth of a degree or 1 10 millionth of a degree is how much these things are being deflected by. So these are really tiny, tiny motions. Um, and oftentimes, they're hard to see individually. But the fact that Gaia has a billion stars in it allows you to amplify that signal and still look for them. Yeah. They're correlated. Yes. Yeah. 
So, so the question is, people try to simulate and study the formation of galaxies, and can they provide us with any information about dark matter? Uh, for instance, its mass. Typically, mass, they do provide us with interesting information. Mass is usually not one of the more interesting uh, things that they provide us with, because uh, as long as the mass is smaller than something, usually around 10 to the 4 solar masses are smaller, then the dark matter just acts like a big gas. And at that point, you're no longer sensitive to the individual masses of the, of the, of the particles. But they can tell us very, very interesting things. As dark matter becomes denser and denser, if dark matter has its own interactions, they can modify the properties of galaxies in those dense regions. So we believe that in the cores of galaxies, you should see a very, very sharp cusp of dark matter where it's a very, very high density. So as you move into the center of the Milky Way, then we expect that dark matter, there should be more and more and more and more dark matter as you move into the center. But if dark matter has interactions, then as it scatters off of itself, it can suppress that and poof itself out. So that in the centers of galaxies, for instance, you wouldn't see those sorts of very large amplifications of dark matter. Now, you can simulate this or try to simulate this, but it's very hard because in the center of galaxies, there's also a lot of non-dark matter. There's a lot of baryons, there's a lot of gas, a lot of energy loss, there's a central black hole. There's a lot of stuff that's changing the dynamics in the, the middle of the galaxy. So simulators are working on this, but it's not the only question that simulators are trying to answer right now. So if you really want to answer this kind of a question, you need a dedicated effort where you bring together people who are more like particle theorists and people who are more like simulators to really put together what kinds of simulations you need, because it would take a lot of computational power to do this and to do it well. So there is information that can be got from people who study how galaxies form and use that to test and understand what kinds of things we expect from dark matter, but right now, I don't think that there's a consensus within the simulations that have been done so far as to what that is. And I think you're going to need a lot more work before we get there. Other questions? So the question is, is there any connection between black holes and dark matter? And the answer is, we don't know. Black holes are a form of dark matter. We believe that there should be a lot of black holes out in the universe just from the fact that they're the end of life for very massive stars. They end up producing black holes. But those black holes, the ones that come about from the end of life of stars, can't be a significant fraction of the dark matter, just for the reason that ordinary matter is a small fraction of the matter, and that's been true for a long time. So there's six times more dark matter than there is ordinary matter. And so if the stars are a tiny fraction of the ordinary matter, then the stars that form black holes is then a subpopulation of that. So you're talking about a small population of the total dark matter. But that's not the only process that could have formed a black hole. We believe that in the early universe that we see these tiny ripples in the light from the Big Bang. And these tiny ripples in light from the Big Bang correspond to regions of the universe where there was slightly more and slightly less stuff. Where, and those ripples that we see are about one part in 10 to the 5. Okay, so it's pretty small. But it's possible that on smaller scales, scales that we can't observe with the satellites that we have, that those perturbations weren't one part in 10 to the 5. They were much, much larger. And if those perturbations were much, much larger, then they would have collapsed and formed into black holes uh, early in the universe. So it's possible that the early universe dynamics may have generated a population of black holes that are out there. People are looking for these black holes. One way to look for these black holes is precisely through this technique that I was talking about here, where these black holes will move across the sky and will cause the stars behind it to be deflected, and you can look for that. You can also look for these black holes as they move in front of a star, and that star becomes very bright and then faint. <laughs> these black holes can come into what are called globular clusters, which are collections of stars that are very, very old, and they can disrupt them, so the fact that they're we see globular clusters that are not disrupted tells us that at least some types of black holes are not around. So there are a variety of tests that you can do um, to ask whether or not the black holes make up a sizable fraction of the dark matter. So far, we have not found any evidence that they do, but it's possible that there are some regions of masses where they might still make up 
all of or almost all of the dark matter that is out there. So I think it's a very open and interesting question to understand whether or not black holes are a sizable part of, of the dark matter, because if they are, those black holes aren't ones that came from stars. They were black holes that were made much, much earlier in the universe. So the question is, aside from the things that we've talked about here, um, are there other techniques that you can uh, use to look for dark matter? So uh, if, I, if I did know of one, I would, I would run off and write a paper on it really fast because it would be really exciting. Uh, so I don't know of them, but I can tell you about lampposts that I didn't discuss here. Um, so uh, this, the, what we talked about here was that if dark matter and ordinary matter can interconvert, then it should be able to bounce off ordinary matter today. You can rotate that picture a lot of different ways. One way you can do it is you can just keep the picture as it was, which is dark matter coming in and turning into ordinary matter. If that happened in the early universe, even though that process stopped, it might be happening at very small amounts today. And if that were happening, then what would be going on is that dark matter today would be coming together, colliding, and producing something. That something could be high energy positrons and cosmic rays, it could be gamma rays, it could be x-rays. And so one thing that people look for is to see whether or not there are excesses of cosmic rays coming from places in the sky where you would not expect there to be cosmic rays coming from. And there's been some controversy of late. There's a particular dwarf galaxy. So around the Milky Way, there are these very, very small galaxies uh, that are much smaller than the Milky Way that orbit around us. And they're a place that people like to look for dark matter. And there have been some claims that one of them, in particular, called reticulum, is, has an excess level of gamma rays coming from it than you would have expected. Now, that level of gamma rays that's coming from it is still pretty small. So I think it's very inconclusive at this point whether or not that's there or not. But it's something that people are excited about um, that you can look for. So um, most of the ways that, I've, that I know of kind of fall into this category of sort of feeling around with the gravitational effects of dark matter and looking for those imprints, or coming up with a really clever model of dark matter or not so clever model and looking for its specific implications. But there are a lot of other options that I didn't go into. Uh, this is just sketching out uh, some of the ideas people are doing. That's right, so our, 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 our belief in the existence of dark matter comes about because of our understanding of other theories like electromagnetism and gravity, yeah. Yeah, but I want to I want to I want to emphasize this point because I think it's a it's it's a it's a good one, which is that uh, people often will look at this and say, "Well, you've not seen the dark matter. Doesn't it seem like a very radical supposition to go out and look at the universe and say, I don't understand how things are moving, and so I'm going to hypothesize the universe is full of this other stuff that's explaining that?" And that's a very reasonable thing that somebody can ask, but. I want to emphasize that dark matter is not a fudge factor in the theory. Dark matter is a very well-defined predictive theory in the sense that even though we don't know the properties of dark matter, we can put it into our simulations, we can put it into our understanding of how the universe should grow, we can calculate all sorts of things from it. We can calculate how galaxies are distributed, we can calculate the properties of the microwave background, we can calculate things like the abundances in the, in the universe, we can calculate how galaxies should be orbiting, we can calculate light being deflected around uh, clusters of galaxies again and again and again and again, dark matter works out. Any time we have a situation where we believe we understand things quantitatively, there are some situations where it's a complicated system and we don't like the centers of galaxies, but any time we have a quantitative handle, the dark matter theory predicts what we observe. 
And so that's very, very strong evidence that, it's, uh, that this theory is correct. Uh, it's not just a fudge factor. It's not just a kludge. It really is out there because uh, it shows up every time we, we expect it to.